Hi folks, it's Cliff here again from Down Under. I'm just going to do another video. Uh, this one would probably be called um, uh, Production Machining Tips and Tricks or uh, Workshop Tips and Tricks. I'm doing another run of these uh, Hallmark Impact Tolerant Touch Probes. Um, quite a big production run of components and really enjoying it. And um, occurred to me a few little things along the way that I've been learning that could be of interest to you guys. Alrighty. And here they are, back from heat treatment, all ready for cylindrical grinding, the impact tolerant touch probe arbors. In this video I'm going to do a few tips and tricks, things that I've been learning in recent months. I'm doing more and more production of parts. This is the internal uh, machining operation of the end caps. Um, I, I won't go into all of the details because if I put my business cap on, I should probably uh, retain some of the intellectual property. Boring, I know. Anyway, but there are some tips and tricks to do with um, production machining that I've been learning that I could pass on that may be of help to one or two of you folk. I know some of you are getting into CNC and have got a little CNC machine. I don't yet have a tool changer. I, I, I probably will be getting one soon. But in the meantime, there's things you can do that save time. If you build a little block like this, um, and have like a whiteboard on the front of it that you can mark your tool numbers on for the particular job you're doing, um, and you can wipe it off and change the numbers for the next job, um, it's really handy because it's a kind of a double check as you're machining. Because you put your, part, you put your tool in, and then you go to your um, path pilot or Mac 3 or whatever and it says insert tool 24 and spindle press cycle start and you think oh you know you might have been running the machine for several hours and your brain's getting a bit tired and you think oh what tool number was that ah but with this little board system you can just glance up and say yep it's tool 24 it's in the machine push go and avoid a crunch up so that, that's really uh, helped speed things up quite a bit actually. Um, I put a little backboard on it because one stage towards the end of the day I was replacing a tool and I missed the hole and it dropped down the back of the machine and I thought there's about a 90% chance that carbide form tool would have broken when it hit the floor <laughs> and I was so lucky it didn't. It must have bounced on some other part because it didn't break and it saved me a lot of work. Another thing I've learned is it's a good idea to have your tool block out of reach of the flying chips and coolant. Um, I used to keep it on the table but found I was just getting it contaminated all the time. Um, so, you know, if you're reasonably tall you can put it on top of the uh, electrical cabinet otherwise you probably want to put it on a little shelf or um, stool or something nearby. And it looks like heat treatments in Auckland have done a really good job. They've beautifully individually packaged each part so it doesn't get damaged in transit and they've got a really good hardness out of the arbors. They've um, claimed 57 Rockwell C which is really hard and durable and I was able to check it because I've got some calibration blocks that I made in the past out of 01 steel and hardened and tempered and uh, hardness tested on an accurate Rockwell C tester so I know the hardness of these calibration uh, testers and the softer than the 57 won't scratch it and the harder than the 57 will so I know that the claims that they've made are honest Another little trick that I've learned which is um, saving time cleaning down the fixture in between part changes. I'll just show that now. Tool 3, press cycle start.
that way when you've done the tool change, uh, sorry, when you've finished machining the different operations, um, you've already got the part and the uh, fixture relatively clean. And while the CNC is running, I'm preparing for a big grinding operation, grinding all the cylindrical grinding all the arbors down. And it's time to change the coolant, wash out the coolant tanks. And I'm using the one coolant tank for both the surface and cylindrical grinder. So I'm getting out all the sludge and crud and washing it out with coolant cleaner and then putting in a new type of better quality grinding coolant that should make the job a bit more pleasant. You might have noticed in my recent video I was getting all nostalgic about my early days in tool making. And when I bought my brown and sharp cylindrical grinder and learned to use that and really loved the sort of mechanical style tool making. Here's the parts for a one of my early unscrewing injection molds. This was a eight cavity rack driven unscrewing mold. Hardened and cylindrically ground. I really love that kind of mechanical tool making parts that shine in the dark and move it's always a bonus of course in these, those days I didn't have CAD or CAM or CNC um, everything was done on a drawing board full size pencil drawings but I have to admit I love my Bob CAD, CAD CAM it is a big step up I think I've mentioned it in another video, um, production tips and tricks, um, how useful three-jaw chucks, especially reverse three-jaw chucks, are for holding disc-shaped parts, um, because it references, repeatably anyway, accurately on the X, Y, and Z. Um, and having two jobs set up at once obviously saves you uh, a lot of tool change time, and a lot of putt change time um, and I think I've got another video mentioning how you can uh, produce through subroutines um, different work offset positions or uh, there was different rotary offset positions in that case of that video but you can either use subroutines or um, you can use just the old copy paste method so you set it up for one part um, and get the get the, the code edited and, and fine-tuned for one part um, and then set up then then for example copy and paste or use subroutines um, if you copy paste just copy and paste the section of code for each tool change uh, so that you've got two lots of uh, code for each tool change and then just manually edit um, the G say the second position which might be G55 um, on the second piece of code for each tool change and that way it'll run backwards and forwards between the two work offsets and run for uh, twice as long automatically and free you up to get underway on some other project. I raved on in a recent video about how important it is to keep chips out of this area because when the y-axis goes back it crunches up the bellows and you really don't want um, debris getting down onto the uh, accurate ball screw underneath. Um, a really good, what I've found is a really good practical solution here is to have a backsplash guard. And it's a really simple part. I'll just show it in operation in a minute. But if it's got a flexible top on it, um, you, can, you can get right down, the spindle nose can get right down almost to the table and it just fits perfectly by coincidence into that little recess zone behind the spindle nose there. Um, it's almost made for it. And so I really want to pass it on to you guys that it's worth it. All it is is a simple Z-shaped piece, piece of uh, sheet metal. 
Okay, I'll show you the specs. So you just get a bit of, uh, could be uh, 0.85 millimeter stainless or steel if you're on a budget. Um, and it's 140 high, 30 deep by 20 high on the little turn down, 780 long, and a piece of corrugated plastic split and slipped over the top, and that allows it to flex when you're coming down really low. And it, and it just keeps that area completely clear of swarth. And I've had a couple of people suggest, well, why don't you design and develop some uh, stainless steel covers like they have on the high-end vertical machining centers? And I, and I really think that it's a, a very challenging thing to do in, in, a, in a restricted space like that, where you've got a whole bunch of chips and swarth uh, compressing up into a very small space uh, with the y-axis travel and even the high-end machines struggle to keep the chips out the uh, rubbers wear out and after a while they break down and they're quite expensive complex parts to make and I really think it's misdirected effort when all you need is a simple piece of sheet metal that just happens to fit really well under these Tormax and possibly under other small CNC machines. Um, of course the front's easy, you can just have a simple plate screwed on. But the back there, I honestly don't think it's worth making something um, that will be both durable and effective and, and uh, not take up too much time and money to build. And it's just lightly held in place with two little pillars. Um, I'll see if I can put the camera around the back and show you that. And um, that way you can just lift it in and out if you ever need to. It's quite interesting. Uh, the design of those high-end telescopic louvers or plates that overlap. Um, on some of the very high-end machines... They've got beautifully made and designed um, telescopic louvers um, and they keep the swarth out for quite a long time although I've, I, I have heard that eventually it starts to migrate through them um, but it's quite interesting it's a classic design dilemma when you've got a, a large area potentially full of chips compressing down into a tiny area and you have to have a whole lot of telescopic plates uh, keeping those chips out under pressure. Um, I've looked at it several times and thought, wouldn't it be great to build something like that? But, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, that's just misdirected effort, trying to do that in a way that will perform to a high degree and not, and not break down and jam up and cause a lot of uh, maintenance issues. Of course, you could fit a loose apron both my manual mills have got that system um, and I think Tormark even sell that a part to do that but I've found that it still bunches up with swarth and um, works its way underneath and is a real hassle to clean anyway so I didn't go down that road so I should be careful saying words like misdirected effort I mean whether it's misdirected effort or not is a very personal thing for some people have got priorities in one area and other people have got priorities in the other and I shouldn't be bigoted and say my priorities are universally correct of course they're not I mean I spend days and days redesigning and modifying enclosures and that's misdirected effort I'm sure I forgot to mention if you take a sketch like that to your local sheet metal shop I, I've 
pleasantly surprised how quick and cheap it is. You know, they'll guillotine it off and fold it up and it'll only cost a few dollars. I mean, I guess in the USA it might only be 20 or 30 dollars to fold up something like that. In New Zealand, I think it was uh, 30 or 40 dollars. You know, really not a lot of dosh at all. I think it's really worthwhile upgrading your coolant motor from the stock motor, which is usually a pretty piddly little less than one eighth horsepower. It doesn't cost too much to buy a quarter horsepower, which has got many times the pressure flow rate for a wash down and a deep hole flushing and deep pocket flushing really pays off. Here I'm engraving the end caps and at the same time machining the countersinks for the cap screws and the central chamfer. And when I did the first production run of the end caps in uh, October 2016, I just left a blank space for the serial number and just hand engraved it. And that's okay for doing a few but I wanted a better system for the bigger production runs that I'm now doing and so I'm using a really good facility that Pathpilot has that allows you to increment, uh, sequentially update the serial number automatically within the Pathpilot software facility and um, so I, I re rotationally orientated the part and I've, I'm using the system I've mentioned before with a, uh, a location plate screwed down on the chuck with a hole in it and then I just drop a drill in to temporarily rotationally orientate the part and then I can rot pull, pull the drill out and it's locked and held in place so that gets it in the correct rotary orientation and allows me to use the conversational facility um, for the sequential serial numbers um, and they will automatically increase um, with each part. So you produce um, your normal bit of engraving code and then you add to it the conversational code uh, which has the G47 serial number macro uh, code on it. Um, I'm not an expert on this but I will do a separate video on the subject because if it's explained by somebody who's not an expert I'm going to explain it in very simple terms uh, at a very slow pace and I know a lot of you folk out there are like me you're not software engineers and um, it takes a while to digest this sort of thing so um, I will do a separate um, uh, YouTube video on uh, sequential serial number engraving. Well, this is just an overview. Um, so I'm using one tool. It's just an old broken six millimeter end mill which I've ground into the shape of a D bit that I can use for several machining operations. I'm using it to machine the engraving, the uh, chamfers, and the uh, countersinks and finally the serial number engraving and um, this means that the part can run over quite a long period of time while I go away and do something else because you'll know that it, uh, a machine like a Tormach 1100 has quite a slow spindle speed of about just over 5000 rpm and that means you've got to use a slow feed rate or you'll chip your cutter and burr the work um, and that doesn't really matter a slow feed rate as long as the part runs automatically and frees you up I seem to be always repeating this line and go away and do something else it doesn't really matter if the machine runs for 20, 20 minutes or 2 minutes as long as it runs automatically and you're doing something else because the hourly rate of a machine like this would be very low here's a little trick I recently have been using I can get the light a bit better. This type of countersink bit that just has one cutting edge is very resistant to chatter. And if you get one that's got a small diameter shank, and you want to put a tiny chamfer on something, you can actually 
backspin it in your fingers to get the maximum rotation position hold it square and just rotate it and just take a beautiful little chamfer off that top edge does that without chatter and um, does a nice tidy little chamfer I think this is where he lives. Wow, what's going on inside that house? Is that the laundry? Some sort of high-tech washing machine. Wow. Thanks for watching, guys. See you again.